Welcome back. In this next video, we are going to discuss statins. However, before we do that, I would just like to say one more thing about familial hypercholesterolemia, and that's to do with inheritance. So let's say that we have an individual who has FH. Now, there is actually two ways in which that individual could have got this genetic disease. The first is obvious, they could have inherited it from their parents. The second is less obvious, which is that they could have been a sporadic case. Now, if they were a sporadic case, what would have happened is they would have had two parents who were normal, not affected by FH, i.e. two parents who have each got two copies of the normal LDL receptor gene. However, those two parents can still actually have a child who does have FH, and that would be called a sporadic case of FH. So let me just write this down. So cases of FH can either be sporadic or they can be inherited. And this is a really important learning point because if you have an individual with FH, it does not necessarily mean that at least one of their parents has to also have FH because they could have been a sporadic case. Now, how do sporadic cases actually come about? Well, they come about because of mutations that occur in the germ cells that are going to create the gametes. So germ cells create sex cells. So in men, they are the cells that create sperm cells. In women, they are the cells that created egg cells. So let me just draw a picture to illustrate uh, how sporadic cases occur a little bit better. So let's say we have mum and dad. So symbol for male, symbol for female. And let's say mum and dad are completely normal. They are not affected by FH. So they both have normal copies of the LDL receptor gene. So what these are representing are both homologous chromosomes that are going to have the genes for the LDL receptors on, and let's say they are completely normal. So dad's two genes are normal, mum's two genes are normal. Now, dad is going to create sperm cells, so I'll just draw a little sperm cell here, and in those sperm cells, remember, gametes are haploid, so one of the homologous chromosomes of each pair is going to be put into the nucleus of the uh, gamete. Um, so one is going to go into the sperm. Now, when germ cells create gametes, and I will just finish the picture by putting the equivalent for females. So of course, in females, the germ cells create egg cells. And again, egg cells will be haploid. So one copy of each of the homologous chromosomes will go in. So one copy of the LDL receptor gene will uh, go into each gamete. Now, when the germ cells create the gametes, the sex cells, they're going to have to copy the DNA. Mistakes can happen in the process when you are copying DNA, and that can introduce mutations potentially into the LDL receptor gene. And those mutations might lead to that gene becoming completely dysfunctional and therefore being um, capable of producing familial hypercholesterolemia. So let's say, to give a concrete example, here we have our two healthy parents without familial hypercholesterolemia, and let's say in a sperm cell, when creating one of the sperm cells, something goes wrong and we end up with a mutation, and I'm just going to demonstrate that by putting a cross here, we end up with a sporadic, hence the name, mutation in the LDL receptor gene that that sperm cell now has. And let's say somehow this sperm cell wins the race to the egg, fertilizes the egg, and then what you're going to end up with is a uh, zygote with one copy of the LDL receptor that is defunctional, this one that was in this sperm cell, and they'll have the other copy which is healthy from mum. So you'll end up with a child that has heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, even though neither parent had it, and that would be a sporadic case. Since we've discussed sporadic cases, let's also just briefly discuss inherited cases. So if we had, let's say, this time uh, dad does have familial hypercholesterolemia, so let's say one of dad's copies of the LDL receptor gene is dysfunctional, then when he's creating sperm cells, half of the sperm cells will end up with the healthy LDL receptor gene and half of them will end up with the dysfunctional mutated LDL receptor gene. If one of the ones that has the mutated gene wins the race, 
then of course you will end up with a child who has heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, and the chance of that happening is 50%, because 50% of them have the mutation and 50% don't have the mutation. And in that case, dad would have passed on his heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia to his child. Let's give another example just to illustrate this. Let's now say that both mum and dad have heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, then, of course, half of dad's sperm cells are going to have a faulty LDL receptor gene and half of mum's egg cells are going to have a faulty LDL receptor gene. And then, work out probability then, what is the chance, let's say, of having a homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia child? Well, it would be you'd need a faulty sperm cell and an egg cell with a faulty LDL receptor gene. And since the probability of having one of each of those is 50%, i.e. probability of a sperm cell having uh, the mutated gene is 50%, and the probability of the egg cell having the mutated gene is also 50%, the probability of getting one of both of them is then a half times a half, which is a quarter. So the chance of that happening is 25%. To look at what else could happen, the chance of the child not having familial hypercholesterolemia at all would be also 25% because the chance of a sperm cell being unaffected is going to be 50%. The chance of an egg cell being unaffected is again 50%. So the chance of getting an unaffected sperm and an unaffected egg is half times a half, which is a quarter. So you've got a quarter chance of having a child with homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia a quarter chance of having a child that has two completely normal LDL receptor genes, and then it's 50% chance that you'll have a child with heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, like both parents, because there's two ways that can happen. You either have a sperm with a faulty LDL receptor gene or and an egg with a healthy LDL receptor gene, and the chance of that happening is a quarter, or you have it the other way around, a sperm with a healthy LDL receptor gene and an egg with a faulty LDL receptor gene. And again, the chance of that specific combination happening is again a quarter, but either of those combinations would give a child with heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. So overall, the chance of having a child with heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia is a half. So just a little brief discussion about um, the inheritance of that. So be aware that if an individual has familial hypercholesterolemia, it does not necessarily mean that their one of their parents at least has familial hypercholesterolemia. It could be that they were a sporadic case. All right, let's move on. Let's now discuss statins. So statins are nowadays the main treatment for hypercholesterolemia. They are how we reduce people's total cholesterol in the bloodstream, how we bring down their LDL levels and try and reduce the risk of atherosclerosis. And as I said earlier, they are generally very, very effective in people with mild um, idiopathic hypercholesterolemia. If you just have mildly raised cholesterol and we give you a statin, we may well be able to bring your cholesterol back down into the completely normal range and hopefully we will then be able to reduce your risk of getting atherosclerotic disease in the future. In people with familial hypercholesterolemia, obviously we've discussed the fact that the hypercholesterolemia can be much, much worse in these cases. And statins may not be capable of bringing it down into the normal range, but they were still effective at bringing it down to some degree at least. Um, so they are still effective in cases of familial hypercholesterolemia. They just may well fail to bring it down into the normal range, but that is uh, common sense. Right. So, how do I want to do this? I think I will start by listing out the names of four statins uh, that I think everyone watching should know the names of, uh, and then we'll discuss the mechanism. So, I'm going to write these in an order. So, if you know anything about the statins, you might like to test yourself and see if you can work out the order that I'm writing these down and what the significance of the order is. So, number one... Rosuva statin. Now you will notice a pattern very quickly. If you've never seen the names of statin drugs before, you will notice a pattern. And that pattern is that they all end in statin, which is very helpful. So Rosuva statin is the first one. Underneath it, a Torva statin. Very, very famous drug. Then Simvastatin, also a very famous drug. And then finally, a less used statin, which is Pravastatin, but I'm still going to mention it because you do occasionally see people on pravastatin. So, 
The two main ones, above all others, that you need to know the names of are atorvastatin and simvastatin. These are the two that are used most of all. Atorvastatin is one of the best-selling drugs ever created, I believe. Now, what is the order that I have written them in here? The order is order of potency, order of power. How strong are they? Rosuvastatin is the strongest statin. It is a very, very powerful statin. So if one of the lower down ones fails to work, we can move people onto Rosuvastatin. Then Atorvastatin is number two, Simvastatin is number three, Pravastatin is the weakest, and we hardly ever prescribe Pravastatin, at least uh, not in the hospitals that I've ever worked at have I seen Pravastatin prescribed that much. The main two that are used are Atorvastatin and Simvastatin. Simvastatin is gradually replacing Atorvastatin. Atorvastatin used to be the go-to one. It used to be the one that everyone was put on. Nowadays, we are gradually moving towards more putting people on Simvastatin. And the reason is that simvastatin is slightly gentler than atorvastatin. You can see that it's lower down on the power list here. But it also has less chance of causing one of the classic side effects that statins has, uh, that statins can have. And the side effect that statins can cause is they can cause muscle cramps. So where skeletal muscles, classically calf muscles, go into that painful spasm. I'm sure everyone will have experienced this before. If you've been on a long jog before or a long walk or you've been stood up all day and you go to bed without doing any stretches and you get that really horrible pain in your calf muscles and you can't move your uh, leg properly, that's a muscle cramp. Uh, it's where your muscle has gone into spasm because it's 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 recovering, still in the process of recovering from the strain that you've put it through. So they're very, very painful. And unfortunately, statins have a classic side effect that they can cause people to get muscle cramps. Not everyone will experience that, of course, but some people will get that. And it can be a reason that they might want to come off the drug. Now, the higher you go up here, the more chance of the drug causing muscle cramps. And simvastatin is generally acknowledged to be less likely to cause muscle cramps than atorvastatin. So it's gradually replacing atorvastatin as the sort of first line statin to go to. So rosuvastatin, coming back to rosuvastatin, it is the most powerful one. And usually what we do is if we put someone on a statin and their cholesterol does not come down as much as we would like it to, then what we can do is we can raise the dose firstly. If it still doesn't work, then we can move them onto a more powerful one. And generally the one that people will be moved on to is rosuvastatin. Pravastatin, as I said earlier, is hardly ever prescribed. It's the least potent of them, um, but I wanted to include it on this list for completion. You do occasionally see people on uh, pravastatin. Right, um, next thing to talk about is the mechanism. How do statins work? Well, the way in which they work is by stopping de novo synthesis of cholesterol. They inhibit an enzyme called HMG, whoops, HMG-CoA reductase. HMG-CoA reductase. So this is an enzyme that is within the cell cytoplasm of hepatocytes, the cells of the liver. And it is an enzyme that performs a crucial reaction in order to make cholesterol molecules. So you remember back to our initial discussion of the input of cholesterol into the body. You have dietary cholesterol, and then you have de novo cholesterol synthesis. Liver cells can make cholesterol out of much smaller molecules. Now, in order for liver cells to do that, there, is a st there are loads of steps in that reaction. It's an absolute nightmare biochemical reaction to make cholesterol. However, one of the steps in that huge, great process uses this enzyme, HMG-CoA reductase, and it is an absolutely crucial step. Statins work by inhibiting that enzyme. They bind to the active site and prevent it from functioning. Hence, by stopping that enzyme from working, they stop the reaction that it would catalyze from happening at any considerable rate, and therefore they stop cholesterol synthesis and reduce de novo synthesis in the liver. Right, so that is the mechanism by which they work. The other important thing to say 
is that de novo synthesis of cholesterol follows a circadian rhythm. It is not uniform at all times of the day. So the, cholest the liver doesn't just synthesize cholesterol all day round at an equal rate. No, it synthesizes most cholesterol at night and synthesizes less cholesterol during the day. Hence, it is important often for people to take statins at night. So they should be taken ideally before going to bed because then they will be at their highest level during the evening, during the early evening. They will bind to the HMG-CoA reductase and inhibit it best at that point, and therefore they will stop de novo synthesis of cholesterol, or at least reduce de novo synthesis of cholesterol down at the time when we actually most need de novo synthesis to be reduced. So that's important. The reason that we get people to take cholest uh, cholesterol tablets, statins, at night is because during the evening, that is the time when de novo synthesis of cholesterol is at its highest, and they work by preventing de novo synthesis of cholesterol. There is an exception to that rule, uh, which is atorvastatin and rosuvastatin. These two you can actually take in the morning if you wish. So these can be taken in the morning. And the reason they can still be taken in the morning is because their half-life is much longer than simvastatin and pravastatin. So even if you do take them in the morning, they're still going to be around in the bloodstream at a high enough level by the evening to take effect and reduce the de novo synthesis that occurs in the evening. Simvastatin and pravastatin, meanwhile, they have shorter half-lives and therefore they really do need to be taken in the evening because by the if they were taken in the morning, by the time evening comes around, their levels would have dropped uh, too much for them to actually have considerable effect at blocking that de novo synthesis. So as a general rule, learn that statins should be taken at, the, at night because de novo synthesis occurs more in the evening and therefore that's where you want to strike. Uh, however, rosuvastatin and atorvastatin have long enough half-lives that they can be taken in the morning uh, if the patient would prefer. Right, and that's really all I've got to say about statins. In summary, they work by preventing de novo synthesis, hence they should be taken in the evening because that's when de novo synthesis is higher. This is the order of potency, rosuvastatin at the top, atorvastatin underneath, simvastatin third and pravastatin at the bottom. The main two that are prescribed are atorvastatin and simvastatin. I would say now, in general practice at least, simvastatin would be the first line go-to for someone with idiopathic hypercholesterolemia. Atorvastatin is slightly stronger but more likely to give this classic side, effects of, side effect of muscle cramps. If it's not working well enough, if the cholesterol is still raised after they've been taking the statin for a while, then what you need to do is increase the dose or move to a more potent statin. Resuva statin is reserved usually for people whose hypercholesterolemia has not responded to statins lower down in this list. Pravastatin is a weaker one. It's occasionally used, but you will hardly see it prescribed compared to atorvastatin and simvastatin. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you've learned something.